Ambassador, uh, thank you very much indeed for uh, agreeing to talk to us. And I'd like to start, if we can, on COP26. And what message does it send out to the world about how serious Russia is about climate change that President Putin chose not to attend COP26 in person? Well, I think that the uh, assessments will be given after it will be over, <laughs> of course. But uh, in the meantime, uh, what I can say as, uh, as an ambassador in this country is that, uh, of course, it, has, uh, been t it took place in a right time. It has alerted uh, very much uh, governments, uh, uh, private industry, people uh, in the countries uh, about the importance of the problem. It has raised awareness uh, uh, about the, the problem, uh, which, is, which is good, I think. Uh, as for my country, uh, I, I will say that uh, the government has uh, taken a very serious program uh, in October this year, which uh, is uh, about low carbon emission of social economic development by the year 2050. And there is a target of the year 2060 when we would like to reach the carbon emission neutrality. It doesn't mean that it can happen earlier, but it will depend uh, on uh, technologies, uh, on uh, financement, and on the balance uh, between uh, all these issues. This program has been presented by the Vice Prime Minister, and we have very important figures from the government and industry in Glasgow who are uh, explaining what, what has happened. But it is the symbolism as well, isn't it? This message to the world of the attendance of the President of the Russian Federation himself. And I mean, there are some suggestions that perhaps President Putin doesn't take climate change quite as seriously as he should. Let me read you a quotation uh, from him from 2017, uh, where he talks about the causes of climate change, uh, say they're caused by changes of global character, cosmic changes, some invisible moves in the galaxy. That doesn't seem to accept that uh, they're man-made, that they're anthropogenic. We are uh, very, uh, very much alert uh, to the, the whole issue because the, temperature, the rise of temperature in Russia is going quicker than in many other countries. And uh, as I said, uh, the uh, program has been uh, done uh, quickly in October, just uh, on the eve of uh, the Glasgow summit, but it was preceded also by the Rome summit of G20, and some world leaders uh, decided to present their pledges, some decided not to present, they trusted uh, other people to it. So in our case, it was a very high level of the presentation. But it is uh, not, I wouldn't say that's not <laughs> very important to advertise the program to the others. Uh, we are doing just, uh, we are simply doing it, what we intended to do. Mm. But what about the goals you mentioned there? Net zero by 2060, not 2050 from Russia, not signed up to the methane reduction program, and indeed on coal, not going to phase that out entirely. Does that not show a lack of urgency? No, no, no. Uh, the, uh, the difficulty is that uh, there is uh, very low knowledge uh, about uh, uh, what we are doing, really. The uh, balance uh, of uh, our energy production is really green. Uh, it is 40% of green energy, uh, of hydro energy, solar energy, uh, plus, um, uh, plus others, and atomic energy, nuclear energy, 40% in the balance. If you add, add gas to it, it will make about 86%, very high figure. You will not uh, find a similar figure in Germany, for instance. It is close to United States. United States is about 76% of green energy. So we are a uh, very low production of coal at the moment, and we continue to do that. Another figure which is important, uh, during the last 20 years, it is each year we are reducing emission of green gases by 2,7%. It is higher than another seven countries, so it's a higher figure. Let me ask you then about gas and gas supply and how dependent Europe is upon the supply of Russian gas. And it's been said that Russia is restricting supplies. It's flowing a bit more now, I know. Restricting supplies to Western Europe to first and foremost get fast approval for the, the vast Nord Stream 2 pipeline, but also to put political pressure on the West. 
Well, I heard about that, uh, and uh, this is not very much uh, truth and not at all. Uh, Gazprom it has a lot of responsibility, and its primary responsibility lays inside Russia. We have had a very cold winter uh, last year and very hot summer. And so the storage uh, capacities uh, are at a low point in Russia as well as in Europe. So the primary task for Gazprom was to fulfill our own domestic storage capacities. Plus, the government is now uh, making the program of uh, gasification of uh, eliminated regions, so it is, needs also a lot of efforts from Gazprom. By yesterday, uh, as it was announced earlier, Gazprom has fulfilled this task, domestic task. It, it is now increasing its uh, uh, pipes, increasing its pipe supplies to Europe, and it is now doing it in the four storages in Germany and in one in Austria. But Russia would like to see the approval of Nord Stream 2 as quickly as possible. The construction is complete. It just needs that approval. Uh, well, it will be funny if I will going to, to, to contradict this point. Of course we do. Why not? We have the consortium of European countries uh, has constructed it, has invested it, and a lot of efforts and a lot of money. And of course we anticipate that it will be approved. Now you'll be aware of uh, Christopher Steele, who uh, came to notoriety uh, being involved, a uh, former um, uh, security uh, services uh, agents from the UK who came to notoriety for, uh, amongst other things, uh, developing the, uh, the the dossier during the uh, during the uh, Trump uh, campaign in the United States. Now, we've interviewed him recently, and uh, he has a theory that uh, the ultimate goal of Russia is to actually collapse, and that's the word he uses, collapse the European Union. You know, could the issue of gas, could what's happening on the border of Belarus and Poland and the Baltic nations, could that be, be part of that program? Uh, well, I, I'm, <laughs> I will say I'm amazed and surprised about the reaction uh, uh, in the European Union to what is happening over there. Uh, it is about uh, 2,000 of immigrants who are now gathered, or perhaps 4,000, because estimations of BBC say and the other sources a bit different. About from 4 to 2,000 uh, immigrants are now at the border uh, between Poland and Belarus. Uh, simply saying that UK is accepting in a good day when uh, Calais, uh, uh, the Strait of Calais is calm, about 1,000 of immigrants. And altogether it's about 20,000 20, of immigrants that has been received peacefully in the United Kingdom this year only. So what is, what is all about it? But it's more than 2,000 uh, coming from Belarus. Lithuania already has accepted 4,000. Uh, no. No, no, no. The figures are much lower. First uh, of all is that uh, it should be humanitarian principles of humanitarian law that should be applicable here. Then, of course, a matter of, of goodwill as well. So there is a law, laws in the European Union and international laws about immigrants. The problem is blown up, of course, and it is very controversial. When European Union was dealing with Turkey, of course, it preferred to pay to Turkey uh, to, to leave these immigrants inside the country. And remember uh, the history about Hungary and and immigrants which were coming via Romania. Everybody was blaming Hungary not, for not to receiving the immigrants. But President Lukashenko of Belarus is laying on extra flights to places like Baghdad. He's encouraging the migrants to come to Minsk and then, in part, taking them to that border to put pressure upon the European Union. Now, Russia, President Putin could have a word. This is one of Russia's key allies. President Putin could have a word, could he not, with President Lukashenko and say, please stop that. <laughs> and they talked, uh, but, uh, and they talked, I have no notion uh, about the subject, how they discuss it, uh, but I think uh, absolutely that the, it is strange to see Polish troops, 12,000 of Polish troops, tanks and the others sealing the borders that just simply not to help these people. Can I ask you just broadly, does, does Russia recognise President Lukashenko as having been legitimately elected? Of course, in Western Europe, uh, we regard it as, as a fraudulent election, that he's, he's not there by popular vote. Uh, 
It is wrong exception. Uh, the President Lukashenko is very popular in its own country, and you will see it. Uh, there is a change of constitution. Things will change. I do not know when and so far. Uh, you'd better ask about this ambassador of Belarus. Uh, but uh, his popularity is uh, unquestionable, absolutely. Let's get on to UK-Russia relations, because uh, we know that uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson and President Putin recently had a phone call. It was last month. Uh, in which um, Boris Johnson said that, of course, the two nations need to work together, but there are still significant problems. And what I'd like to ask you, Ambassador, is from the Russian perspective, what does the UK and other nations, what, what, what do we have to do to normalise these relations from, from the UK perspective? Of course, it's dealing with issues which we'll get onto in more detail in a moment or two, the Salisbury poisonings, the, the cyber attacks. From the Russian perspective, is it, in part, stop accusing us of doing those things? Uh, you are right. Uh, President uh, Putin and uh, Prime Minister Johnson uh, spoke on the eve of Glasgow conference, and they spoke for about uh, 45 minutes. Uh, they discussed uh, several subjects, uh, and they fully agreed about one, one issue, that the uh, relationship between the United Kingdom and the Russian Federation are not one that they want. It's an important constatation. It's a desire of both leaders uh, to bring um, a relationship between the two countries to a new and a better level, of course. I uh, think that uh, there was a good chance when uh, UK has uh, withdrawn from uh, uh, European Union uh, for the United Kingdom to establish new and better relationship with Russia. It gives many new opportunities, also for businessmen as well. And I'm talking to British businessmen and their saying, uh, they are telling me that uh, for them, of course, it will be better to deal uh, in business with Russia than to go very far to the east uh, for uh, the terrains that do not uh, bring uh, immediate rewards and so on, and to talk to European countries and to deal business with Russian businessmen and with Russia. So, um, Ambassador, you seem to be saying that uh, you see Russia sees an opportunity for a UK-Russia trade deal, these much sought post-Brexit trade deals? Uh, much, much better, of course. We do believe that there are opportunities for mutually beneficial trade and mutually beneficial business and for better uh, exchanges uh, between us. And we are expecting that the British government will come to this conclusion pretty soon. <laughs> Are there any talks, even at the informal level, taking place on that issue on a trade deal? Very, very slow. No, not on the uh, not on the trade deal. Not on the trade deal because uh, British government, uh, some years ago, has abolished uh, all the governing bodies. We did have a joint commission uh, on trade, and we did have a joint agency on energy. So uh, all structures has been abolished by British government. Well, I mean, you know what would help restore these relations is that attack in 2018 on British soil, a poisoning attack, killed a British citizen, attacked uh, two Russian citizens and carried out by, by Russian agents. There are now three names, we all know them, three names identified by the investigating authorities in the United Kingdom and Boris Johnson says, hand them over for justice. Mm -hmm. Well, this approach is not serious. Uh, I know that uh, in this country, the criminal stories uh, in uh, the style of James Bond are very popular, of course, and uh, they are appearing in the newspapers, they are being repeated in Westminster, and the government has to react. If you would like to put it on a serious basis, there are views, there are possibilities of a serious exchange on the level of the experts, on the level of special services and so on. But uh, British government is constantly denying uh, this option of doing it. The board have had access to the suspects, either you know, perhaps in the Russian embassy here in London or allow British police to, to interview them in Russia. <laughs> like it is in the films. <laughs> well, Ambassador, it's a very serious point. As to say, you know, a British citizen has died, others have been permanently injured, and, uh, and, and, and two Russian citizens nearly died. Your uh, appropriate authorities are perfectly aware how to deal with this, not through the newspapers, but how to deal uh, with these issues properly and, uh, uh, and in a right way. Americans uh, know how to do this. I do believe that Brits are not as well. And the other issue which one imagines 
could start to normalise or certainly improve relations is the issue that, uh, that I know that uh, you've had discussion with, discussions about when you were, were called in by the Foreign Office, this issue of cyber attacks, cyber attacks emanating from Russia, perhaps not necessarily traced all the way back to the Russian state, but, but, but you are hosting those that carry out these attacks. Yes, uh, everybody is accusing us, but uh, the proponents of the re-evil group were arrested yesterday, as I understand. So among of them are two Romanians uh, and one Ukrainian, as I understand. So you say you, you we're are Russians over there. <laughs> Let me move on um, to the issue of, of Afghanistan and uh, that chaotic withdrawal by coalition forces at the end of the summer. Can I ask you, did Russia, watching all that, have a degree, I suppose, of schadenfreude in that um, you know, the former Soviet Union was involved for a long time in Afghanistan and uh, had to withdraw after a military defeat? Um, did Russia watch what was happening there? 20 years of occupation, $2 trillion spent, 250,000 lives or more lost, and the Taliban are back in control. How did Russia view that? Well, uh, it is, uh, we are not, uh, uh, I would say, happy about that at all. Uh, we are worried about some aspects of that, and we think about necessity of damage control of it. It is most necessary. So uh, the uh, damage is, uh, for us, uh, it is all possibilities of overspill of uh, terrorism to the neighboring countries, in Central Asia specifically. And we are helping these countries right now with military force as well, with border force as well, to prevent that. And uh, we are in constant consultation with Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, who are neighboring over there. This is one aspect. The other aspect, of course, we are uh, worried about uh, issues of education, about human rights, about uh, uh, life of women over the year. And we are watching very closely what Taliban is doing. We are not, we still consider Taliban as a terrorist organization since uh, very many years, because it has done a lot of, produced a lot of terrorists that has gone to Russia since that time. And uh, we are watching what is happening. Happening. And we are uh, doing our conclusions, uh, uh, and uh, we did not yet has finally. We, we stand for uh, the government uh, that will be inclusive, that will include uh, all Tajiks, Uzbeks over the year, and will should be democratic. So, do you share the UK and US assessment and others about this Taliban government, this Taliban rule? That you, you're watching and waiting, you're judging by their actions whether or not the Russian Federation will recognize them as the official government. This was one of the subjects that has been under discussion between Prime Minister, uh, your Prime Minister and President Putin, and uh, there were many points of agreement about that. But what about um, that question about um, the coalition's withdrawal? Did Russia feel that they made a mess of it? Well, yes, of course. <laughs> and a lot of damage produced. And the withdrawal of a coalition, it is another source, uh, it has another source of immigration. Migration will be much bigger, of course. Uh, at the moment, it is more or less stable over there, but we fully understand that the country is on the verge of humanitarian crisis. And uh, all sources like World Bank and all the others should uh, bring money into the country to prevent uh, this, uh, this crisis. Is Russia prepared or is it already offering humanitarian aid? Of course, we have our own convoys and we are doing our own efforts quite a lot. And we are receiving uh, uh, people from Afghanistan, especially students. Quite a very big number of students are now have been brought over the border and they are studying in the Russian institutions. And Ambassador, lastly, can I ask you about the, the COVID-19 situation in Russia? I mean, you must be monitoring it very closely indeed. It's looking very worrying at the moment, isn't it? Um, in comparing situation with what's happening uh, in the United Kingdom, it is a similar figure of daily infections, nearly similar. It is between 30 and 40, so it is declining. At the moment, it is declining both. But 1,200 deaths a day, that's far, far more. That's a factor of six or more higher than the okay. UK. Our country and population is bigger than in the United Kingdom, so figures should not be compared. I fully recognize that the death uh, tolls is higher than it should be. A vaccination should be 
be should include more people. Uh, and uh, uh, by the way, I uh, I praise uh, the system that in the United Kingdom is pushing people for a vaccination by letters and by other means. Uh, uh, we perhaps should be, do more uh, in this area, and uh, the government is trying to do more in this area by by different means. But do you think this comes from the top? You mentioned the the vaccine scepticism amongst the Russian population. Of course, Russia was the very first to develop a COVID vaccine. How long ago that seems uh, at uh, the end of the summer in 2020. But do you think that comes from the top in that it seemed that Russia in 2020 didn't take COVID very seriously. Indeed, the authorities, President Putin, didn't act. The scepticism is raising in different countries, in Switzerland, by the way, one of the most European of all European countries. Uh, that is phenomena for a different population. And uh, we just need to raise awareness uh, of people uh, uh, to, to do vaccination. And besides, what we would like to, uh, seriously speaking, to do is uh, that mutual recognition of vaccines, uh, of course, uh, in uh, European Union, in the United Kingdom, in, in Russia, uh, should be done as quick as possible. European European Union has the day before yesterday recognized Chinese vaccines and the UK has, has done it the same. So we recognize three Chinese vaccines. So we are just waiting when Russian Sputnik and the other vaccines will be recognized by International Health Organization. And we hope it will be quickly recognized in the United Kingdom. Ambassador Keeling, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy.